Sure, no, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, sorry about that glitch, uh, but I think, Charnel, you can get started. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Charnel Sanders from American Military University. I'm so glad that you are all here. It's the last one of the day. Uh, so I hope you all had um, an enjoyable conference. I was able to step in on um, a few of the um, sessions and all of you are amazing. So um, go ahead and get started. Um, I hope you all were able to do, I saw that some of you did uh, the poll that I uh, put out last night. Um, how would you categorize the DC snipers? Um, this has been a, a little bit of a debate, um, a little bit of my background. I went to the University of Detroit Mercy um, in a dual master's program for criminal justice and intel analysis, so behavior analysis, and this was um, a consistent uh, debate, and we never really settled on one, and um, hopefully maybe by the end of this, uh, we will have settled a little bit on it, but 43% uh, of you said uh, domestic terrorists, and then it was even for mass murders, and uh, one as a murder, and one as a terrorist, at about 24%. So, uh, yeah. All right, so uh, this um, this thing here, a comparative uh, case study applying the routine um, the routine activity theory to explain terrorism um, is a conceptual uh, thing that we have here. Um, what what led me to this uh, was just the fact that we we tend to separate. Um, crime and terrorism. And terrorism is fundamentally a crime. Um, it's in the definition of terrorism. And so how can we then uh, bring the two together to help us explain terrorism? So here uh, we have the routine activity theory, which is uh, the, the four corners of this uh, motivated offender, uh, the three corner, the three, the three prongs of this motivated offender, suitable target and absence of a capable guardian. And that's what gets, gets you a crime. Uh, you have to have all three at the same time in order for you to have a crime. If any one of these are missing, then you don't necessarily have a crime. And so uh, the question that I'm working off of is how does the routine activity theory explain terrorism? The working hypothesis here is uh, terrorist attacks are more likely to occur when a motivated terrorist or group uh, identifies a vulnerable target in a location with a weak security measures, uh, a specific time and place, increasing the opportunity for a terrorist attack to take place. So here I'm basically saying that terrorism is an opportunistic uh, thing. It's not necessarily political or religious. Um, sometimes we put it just in that category and sometimes it may just be opportunistic um, and then it gets categorized as terrorism after the fact. Uh, the, the offender may not set out to be a terrorist when they start, uh, but it becomes a terrorist act once they're finished. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more at the end. This graphic here um, is again, just to, to push this a little bit forward, uh, you have the crime, you have terrorism and in the middle, uh, where it comes together again is that uh, that crime triangle here. Uh, the methodology is the comparative case study. So we have David David Berkowitz, who is uh, the son of Sam. Uh, he is a convicted serial killer. Ted Kaczynski, uh, also known as the Unabomber, he is a convicted. Uh, he was he was convicted of. Uh, domestic terrorism. John Muhammad and Lee Malvo, the collectively known as D DC Sniper, they weren't technically put as DC Snipers, DC Sniper. Um, John Muhammad would was actually, uh, he was convicted 
uh, as a domestic terrorist. Lee Malvo was not convicted of terrorism, just murder. And so using uh, the comparative case study, we get into to those uh, four. So I started out with what is terrorism? So looking at the definitions of terrorism uh, from the FBI, uh, from the literature, going through the literature review, uh, looking at what the current literature says, um, what even some of the statutes say, I'm here in Michigan, I'm originally from Kansas, uh, how they define legally what terrorism is, how they uh, prosecute terrorism. In Michigan, they don't say anything about um, they don't say anything about religion or the government. Um, in Kansas, they do talk about the government. In Virginia, they do talk about the government. Uh, there's a few other states they talk about the government. In other places, they don't talk about the government. Uh, so it just um, and I found that interesting um, that they all kind of have their own uh, take on how they. Um, how they prosecute or how they define what terrorism is um, as far as the religion and the and the political side of it. Um, and so I just started with what is terrorism? Um, in the end, again, it's all crime. Uh, one thing that they all had in common was terrorizing. They all had in common uh, the, um, the overall public, putting in fear to the public. Um, being a danger to the mass public, to uh, the um, the larger uh, citizens. Um, so even now, active shooters, um, they're putting into uh, terrorism, uh, into the terrorism pot. So um, everyone, it just depends on what state you're in. They they're they're having their own definitions of terrorism. Um, so again, I found that interesting, but that's kind of where I started. Where, what is terrorism and how, how are they defining terrorism? And then I went into uh, four guiding principles for a motivated offender. For the sake of this uh, presentation, I'm only going to focus on uh, the one, um, one part of the triangle, which is the motivated offender. So took four guiding principles for a motivated offender, behavioral characteristics, cognitive characteristics, the cultural characteristics, and societal characteristics. So for every crime, you have to have an action and you have to have um, intent um, to be considered a crime. You have to actually do it and you have to actually um, mean to do it. You have to say, yeah, I wanted to do that and I did it. Um, you have to have, and then there's three stages of the cognitive, uh, the motivation, the planning and the normative um, neutralization. The normative neutral neutralization is the rationality. Um, how do I rationalize what I've done? Um, and we'll get into that again when uh, we get to some of the specifics. Cultural characteristics, um, meaning how does the society, how, what, what does society do to me? What do I think society did to me uh, that made me go out and do this crime or commit this crime. And then societal reactions. Um, what am I doing? What do I want the public uh, to feel or do um, with what I am doing or what I have said? What? How do I want them to feel? How do I want them to react? Uh, so those four guiding principles that then all contribute to the motivated offender. Um, and so then I, um, I'm i going to do this inventory. And so again, for the sake of this presentation, just did a pared down version. Um, by far, this it'll be way more, way more um, extensive than this. Um, but starting with the basics for for each for each person. Um, so having this this table here, the category, they're a criminal. And the category may not be defined because we may not know who, who that person is if they haven't been, um, you know, we may, we may not know who they are or, or what category they're in. Um, but as we're learning and as we're building this, um, this type, this, uh, this theory, we're taking the, uh, 
the, the historical data that we have and we're finding these individuals, we know what they're convicted of using that category and putting that in, what were they convicted of? How were they convicted? What were their targets? And then the cognition, that's when we get into the motivated offender. Um, so with Son of Sam, his motivation, he put in, he was a, it was demonic possession. Um, so where I'm able to pull this data from is the writings of these individuals, um, getting their manifestos, pulling out um, the, these, these, these individuals, what's interesting about them, they all sent communication to either the media, uh, the police, they left stuff at the crime scene, or uh, once they were taken into custody, they had stuff in their uh, possession, they left diaries, notebooks, or whatever, and they um, had all of their writings and rantings of their crimes that they left that we were able to now glean um, their motivations, their plans, and their rationality um, for why they committed these crimes. Um, and then they also, especially the son of Sam, he did a bunch of interviews. And so um, I was able to watch a lot of the interviews and hear some of the things that he um, he said. And so being able to watch some of the, the stuff he said, read some of the stuff that he said and what he was sending, you're able to then put in some of these things. And all of them, uh, again, were able, they, they all sent a lot of information. They all communicated that way. Um, and that was the best way um, to build this inventory is to find those individuals that did communicate that way. And um, unfortunately, fortunately for, for my study, uh, there are a lot of individuals that did communicate um, that way uh, through writings, sending them to, uh, to um, law enforcement or leaving it. And so I'm able to build this inventory out with the motivation, the planning, and their um, their rationale. And then their culture, again, just what is it that has influenced them from, uh, from the outside, from society? And then the social re reactions, what do they want people to feel? Um, so again, Son of Sam, he his motivation, he, he said that is the, the, the dog's uh, the dog next door um, was a demon and that demonic possession is what told him to, to kill. And so he was ordered to kill and that is why he did it. And his planning was he would ambush at night, but leading up to that planning, um, he actually first started out by stabbing individuals and then leading up to that. Um, and then he wrote notes to police and taking responsibility for it all. Um, but then you have the Unabomber who was convicted of a domestic terrorist, domestic terrorism. Um, and his rationale and his motivations, personal revenge, bomb making, his target selection, he wrote all of that into his journaling. Um, and his rationale, the individuals were hurting um, that were hurting the environment and manipulating the public. And so he kind of saw himself as, as the public savior. Um, and so he definitely had that undertone of um, the government and uh, the, the, the public part of it. Um, and then moving into John Muhammad, again, he had the discrimination and treatment while he was in the army as his rationale um, for it. Um, and then his influence was discrimination in the army again. And then he had DV charges. So he had the police part in it um, that he was angry about. Um, and so as I moved through, um, through some of these, I started noticing the pattern and looking through, and it's the cognition part, that motivated offender part that I started seeing the pattern. Um, if any one of the motivation, planning, or normative neutralization involves the government or the public, um, then they fell into that domestic terrorism part. So looking at the Unabomber, his uh, new normative neutralization, the individuals that were hurting the environment and manipulating the public, that is for him, um, that was the part that was the public. 
his his rationale was the public. And so there he is. He was he was convicted of domestic terrorism. John Muhammad, he had um, his his um, reasoning and his justification for committing his crimes was his discrimination and treatment while he was in the army. Um, that is a government, a pushback from the, for the government. And he was also then uh, convicted of domestic terrorism. Whereas David Berkowitz and Lee Malvo, they none of their um, none of their cognition, all of it was just personal stuff, demonic possession, ambush, um, longing for the father, manipulation. That's personal stuff, and they were both convicted of of criminals. So. Um, of course, we I still have to go through and and we have to continue to to look through that and get a um uh more and more to to determine if that is uh a if that's an actual um to verify that and get the validity the validity of that um result. But so far, that is what um that's that's what I've been finding as I move through. Uh, more and more of these individuals. Um, but here, the target is not even in, it's not even a, um, in part of the, uh, part of the, um, the rationale of, of their, of their um, domestic terrorism or criminal or criminality. Uh, because the DC snipers, it was random, even though John Muhammad says that he wanted to kill his wife and he thought, you know, it'll be buried in all these random people. It was never really, uh, you know, he's he's gone now and it was never really, okay, did he really want to kill his wife or, you know, or was he just killing people? Um, but it was random. Ali Malva, it was just random. They, they just killed people. And so, uh, but Ted Kaczynski, uh, he did have a plan and it was all again written out exactly what and who he was planning to kill. Um, and so again, as you move, it was as we move through um, some of these individuals uh, where the pattern occurred was in the cognition, um, was in the cognition column. And so uh, where I go from here, where we go from here is uh, the target suitability, we still have to go to the rest of the, go through the rest of the crime triangle, still have to go through the target. We still have to go through the guardianship and deterrence. Is there still something else? Um, can we identify a pattern in the rest of the crime triangle uh, to then be able to apply uh, the rest of the routine activity theory um, to terrorism to find that true nexus of crime and terrorism. And that's it. Any questions, comments? Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, first question, what areas do you see as ripe for further research regarding the routine activity theory and terrorism? Are there specific contexts or phenomena that you believe warrant deeper exploration? Yeah, so just per, in particular, the the using criminology and and terrorism together, how do we how do we put the two together? Um, because we were we're studying them separately when they should be studied together. Um, they should be studied as as one piece, and w but they're not. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly. Um, I hope that makes sense. But uh, terrorism is being studied as its own phenomena when it is a, a type of crime. And if we were to apply some of the criminology um, and some of the the crime theories to terrorism, then I think we would be able we'd have we'd be closer to understanding uh, why terrorism exists and why um, and why they're occurring, and then that would then in turn help us with uh, the the analysis part of of terrorism. 
Thank you. I think it makes sense in so far as it's just a representation of how a lot of times uh, academic fields tend to exist in their own silos, even yeah. though, of course, they are very related. And so I guess a follow up question might be, what do you see as some of the main obstacles for academics to bring these two fields together? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I think I think the hardest thing is because when you think of crime, you just think of, you know, murder, robbery, that kind of thing. And terrorism, you think of religion, politics. And I think that's where, where the disconnect is. Um, we only think of terroristic acts as being motivated by religion, pop, po um, political uh, motivations, when again, sometimes it's just, it's opportunity. And they may not get categorized as a terrorist act until it goes to court. And that's when it's, oh, now that's terrorism. Um, and I again, I think we're moving a little closer to that um in the individual states but in academics we're not there and that's why it's so fragmented in the states because everybody has their own definition of what terrorism is because some of them it's sim it's simplistic oh well terrorism is you are a terror to the city you're a terrorist you're a terrorist to the state but yet the definition of of it is it is more complex than that and we should treat it as more complex than that. But at the same time, it may not be that complex. It is, it probably is. I am a terror to the city um, and I am a terrorist, but it's not because I have a political beef. It's not because I have a religious beef. Um, I just am a terror. Um, so I think that's that's the reason why why it's not because when terrorism first really was introduced to us, it was because it was a religious and political slant and not um, not really a criminal slant. Thank you. Here's one question uh, from Sagar Carr. Can routine activity theory and terrorism be really linked as if, let me reread it. Can routine activity theory and terrorism be really linked as the theory might lessen the gravity of the mens rea of the criminal? I think I think it can be linked. Um, I understand what you're saying, but I think in, in some cases it can be linked because again, it's not, um, in, in the case of, uh, so for example, we had an active shooter here in Michigan a couple of years ago. And um, it was it was a student. He wasn't put down as a terrorist until he went to court. I mean, he really wasn't a terrorist. He he what he did was he went to court. But because of our definition of terrorism, that's why he was he was convicted of terrorism. He, but based on the routine activity theory, he was an he was an opportunist. He. He knew what he knew. He was motivated for sure because he was already angry. He was upset. He wanted to go and he wanted to kill the people that he felt were doing him wrong. Um, and he went and did it. The school wasn't doing much to protect anybody else. And he did it. So I think in some cases it is that. And I, I think we miss an opportunity to uh, to apprehend people when we don't view it that way. Um, to say, okay, this is an opportun this person is an opportunist and it's not, it may not be religious, it may not be political. Um, it could be that they're they just want to kill people. Um, and in that case, it may just be a criminal. Um, and I think that's what I'm what I'm trying to get at is sometimes the terrorism is it may not be terrorism until until you apprehend the person. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Now, as I investigate, this is terrorism. Um, 
I hope that makes sense. But I, I think it just, it just, there are some cases where it does work. Thank you. Um, one more, one question from Nikhil Chandranath. Can routine activity theory create victim blaming? No, no, um, it, it doesn't. A suitable target just means it's from the it's from the the offender's perspective. In their mind, they're a suitable victim because they're because I'm motivated and because there's an absent uh, guardian. Um, that's that's what routine activity theory says is just suitable target because I'm motivated and you don't have a, and you don't have. Um, and I don't, I don't perceive that person or that thing as a, uh, as a guardian. Um, so no, I, I don't, I don't believe that it, it is victim blaming at all. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, but thank you, Charnel, for this great presentation. Uh, thank you to our attendees for those great questions. And uh, we've reached the end of the conference. We will be emailing you next week uh, once the video recordings of all the sessions are posted. Uh, all these videos are open access and we encourage people to use them for teaching and classroom purposes. Uh, we will be letting you know. Uh, thank you, Charnel, and thank you, everybody. Everybody. Uh, you have a good weekend. Bye.